This is Marco Reus. This is Shinji Kagawa. This is Nuri Shahin. Hello, this is Jaden Sancho. And you're listening to the Yellow Wall Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 456 of the Yellow Wall Pod. I'm your host, Stefan Wolzko. And today we will talk about Borussia Dortmund beating Newcastle United in the Champions League 1-0. And then we will focus our attention on the Bundesliga where Dortmund also had yet another 1-0 win against Werder Bremen. And of course we will preview Sunday's game against Eintracht Frankfurt. For all that and more, joins me Matthias Zug with a almost live reaction yeah. post game because yeah. the final whistle blew like what 5 minutes ago if if even yeah if, if even. even yeah i mean man to beat uh saudi united fc <laughs> in england was just uh so nice so nice and and uh whew, deep breath at the end but uh yeah it was that was fun that was fun because it went Dortmund's way for once in England. So yeah, um, I don't know. I'm I'm very happy, Stefan. I'm very happy. How about you? Yeah, obviously happy. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a big result because uh, you know Group F is uh, certainly referred to as the group of death in the Champions League, and uh, Dortmund now jump to second place in the group stage. Uh, they are level on points with Newcastle, but I think. It is the head-to-head -head result that counts because yes, the goal differential correct. is minus one while Newcastle's is plus two. So Dortmund currently beat out Newcastle. So obviously the reverse fixture, which I think is on the uh, 6th of November, will be a massive game for Dortmund and can uh, really, you know, push this into Dortmund's favor. But, uh, you know, that being said, it's it's far from over then because uh, Milan and PSG are obviously all very strong uh, two in this group. And uh, <laughs> it's on a rather's edge. But, uh, yeah, I mean, let's talk about uh, what obviously had to happen. Uh, according to my wife, when uh, Julian Brandt sent out the thank you post after his 300th Bundesliga match uh, of staying fit and healthy for so... Uh, much of that period since he started playing in the Bundesliga since I think he was 17. Uh, so obviously he was going to be injured right away after that. Uh, thank you note jinxed himself. And uh, yeah, uh, Dortmund entering this game without their best player or currently hottest player on form. Um, nevertheless, um, when I looked at the lineup, uh, I was pretty pleased uh, for Tessic to, to go with uh, the three midfielders with uh, Zabitza. John and uh, Mecha and uh, yeah I must say it worked out now I must be honest Matthias uh, you have to help me out a little bit because I think I missed like the first 25-ish minutes or so because I was still working so I didn't quite uh, witness that um, but uh, from what I've heard Dortmund by then already had a couple of chances so did Newcastle uh, commentator said Kobel had to make a save so um, before we talk about um the uh, deciding goal, obviously, of the day. Um, maybe how did the game start? How, Dort how did Dortmund find into it? Well, I think in general, Dortmund were set up to counterattack. And I think that was the plan from the get-go. If there's one thing Dortmund have learned so far this season is how to be solid defensively, which uh, isn't really something we're used to saying ever after the last, I don't know, 10 years. Um, but uh, that, that was really what it was. Dortmund uh, gave Newcastle the possession or, you know, ceded it to them mildly in the uh, first half. But Dortmund with significantly better and more chances. Nick Pope having to make two big saves back-to-back. -back. Kubel had to make one save. Uh, that was shot right into his gigantic chest. Uh, I mean, this is this was the match of two gigantic goalkeepers. So, um, in, in that respect, you know, honestly, Dortmund should have scored more in that first half. Didn't. Um, but at the end of the day, they scored as much as they needed to, which was nice to see. Um, and of course, you can make the argument Newcastle should have scored once or twice uh, in the second half. 
So, I mean, it was razor's edge. The weather was absolutely atrocious. <laughs> I mean, talk about a, a cold, rainy night in Stoke, uh, Newcastle. Um, this was it. And it played to the advantage of Dalton. But what I like about Dalton is they didn't park the bus. They didn't like, oh, we're just going to sit back and do nothing all match. Uh, like some teams who play quote unquote defensive would do. Not at all. They were always looking to attack. And I will make the argument, Stefan, that um, we did see Dortmund's problem this season in this match as well in not being able to finish off counterattacks more often, more consistently, and more effectively. Um, also in the second half. I mean, there were a few counterattacks in the last 10 minutes that just petered out because of bad decision-making, the wrong decision-making. And that that was kind of there in the first half. I think that's the lack of Julian Brandt effect. That being said, it still was the best-looking uh, Borussia Dortmund without Julian Brandt this season. And so overall, can't really complain too much. Uh, Nico Schlotterbeck once again proving that he's an outstanding attacker. Uh, hey, he grabbed the assist. <laughs> he grabbed the assist. You know, if it's not Julian Riasson, it has to be Nico Schlotterbeck. Um, but no, I mean, Dortmund started, I'm not going to say on the front foot, but they started as the better team. I would say they were the better team in the first half. And then you can make the argument that Newcastle were the better team in the second half. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Uh I think Dortmund settled in fairly well, uh, or, or rather when I tuned in, they had settled in fairly well. And uh, what I must uh, commend them for is that they pinged the, the ball around quite quickly. I think the sweat patch obviously had, um, but uh, yeah, especially uh, Marlon and Royce uh, did shred a few defenders here and there. Um, there was some uh, really good football to, to watch, and I think um, there was this one chance, I think it was Marlon in the end, who had a, had a shot blocked. Um, where we had a good entry pass, uh, then was played right into Royce into the box, and he squared it off to Phil Cook, who then squared it off to uh, to Marlon. And uh, to me, this is the sort of uh, chance creation we haven't seen from Dortmund in, in quite a while. And I feel like in the last uh, three, four games, we've we have seen it a bit more frequently. Um, so that I think is very good to see that the the, the positional. Uh, discipline is there, and obviously the the skill set of the players to um, you know, facilitate such an attack uh, very quickly against Newcastle, who were uh, almost the entire way a step too late. I think had uh, Fukrug managed to get it off a little bit quicker, he could have even taken a shot himself. There was uh, just a little bit of delay, but the point stands: we have a good positioning. Um, to have very vertical play and, and find the channels between the defenders. And if you can find Royce in a channel between the defenders, uh, then <laughs> danger usually ensues. And uh, so I'm fairly happy with the, uh, with the uh, stability of the team, with how they played football, how quickly they moved. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I feel like Dortmund could have even created uh, far more chances. They, to me, looked like the more dangerous side throughout the entire game. And you know what's odd? Newcastle obviously did manage to build a lot of pressure, especially in the last 10 minutes, because as you said, Dortmund's counterattacking kind of broke down, um, which was of course disappointing. And they did manage to hit the crossbar twice. Uh, once I think of, of a set piece, if not, if not both times. Um, that all being said, I never really, just like in the Bremen game, had the feeling that Dortmund were going to concede now. I don't know about you, but I was relatively calm considering it was just a one a lead and uh, there was an opponent who had to score um, to really uh, advance their Champions League campaign. Um, so, you know, considering all the things we've just seen and considering how poorly Dortmund have played in the past or especially at the beginning of the season, um, we can take a lot of positive away from that. I think the last episode we had last time, Matthias, uh, the headline or the, the episode title was Positive Trends and uh, I'm very glad to check back in like a week later and we can still <laughs> confirm that because how often have we said something positive and then right around Dortmund turn and uh, say, nope, <laughs> we're gonna screw everything up now. So yeah, this looked like a very 
calm, very professional, very mature Champions League performance against an opponent um, who are new to this stage. And uh, maybe that showed a little, but uh, obviously I, I think Dortmund were also a bit lucky uh, with the injuries on Newcastle side because I think Alex Isak uh, is a big loss for them. Obviously, Joel Linton is a, is a player we still know from Hoffenheim and we all know he's very dangerous. But not just the same, uh, going a little forward. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know about you, but I thought um, overall Dortmund were in a very even match and uh, were the deserved winners in the end. I agree, because if, if going from what you said, whether it was Bremen or now Newcastle, aside from two times, um, once in Newcastle, once against Bremen, Kobel really didn't have to make any saves from open play. And I think that is a huge, huge thing to talk about, is that from open play opponents... Whether it's uh, a Bremen who obviously are are staring more at a uh, bottom half of the table uh, fight, or Newcastle who are a more top half of the table Premier League side, the fact that Dortmund are able to stymie open play chances from opponents while still being effective as an attacking team themselves, I think that's a huge bonus. I think that's that's big. Um, of course, Emre Can having to come off uh, injured, not great. But Zalia Can, I thought, played really well. Yeah, started really well. perfectly well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, solid. It was like the perfect game for him. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say not the greatest refereeing performance I've seen know. in this match. I'll be honest, I thought um, it was fine. I've seen worse in the Champions League. Yeah, I mean... I, I was annoyed that he blew for halftime right when <laughs> Dalton were at the halfway yeah, that was mark a on a counter attack. I wasn't like, quite sure if he really? if he whistled a free kick before and then decided yeah. it was halftime instead of yeah, giving I don't it know. to Newcastle. But yeah, it was yeah. odd. It was it was odd. There were a few little odd inconsistencies. Um but no, overall, Dalton. I think if we ask Newcastle fans, they're not yeah. entirely happy with the ref. Correct. Either. So and as we can always say, if both sides aren't happy, it was probably a good refereeing performance. Like I say, it, it was consistent. Fine. It was consistent. What I liked know? about the referee actually is that uh, you know there were some really crunching challenges, and uh, he let it go. You know the the way, for example, that uh, Schlotterbeck won the ball off. I think Gordon it was uh, before the goal, um, which is obviously important to talk about because um, I've seen Bundesliga refs. Uh, give this as a free kick even though it was all ball and uh, and yes he obviously also did play the man in the same at the same time or a little later than uh, playing the ball but nevertheless uh, a very good no call in my book and uh, so i have i have very little to complain about maybe uh, also due to the results but uh, not honestly to me the referee today is not a huge talking point like it has been before in in champions league matches where there have been very odd decisions um, especially like uh, when Dortmund played Man City or so, um, yeah. I don't want I don't want to really talk about that, but um, yeah. What what I think is is very positive is that uh, the midfield shape and the, the defensive shape overall um, was uh, very cohesive, and that to me is a positive sign because very often Dortmund uh, have massive spaces and uh, especially shout out to to Zabitza, who I thought um, had the had a classic game of a play you hardly notice, but he makes a lot of difference. He, he closed a lot of gaps. He pressed a lot of players. Also very late in the game still. I'm um, always going 100% out there. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm very happy with that sort of performance because, uh, you know, he, he's doing the dirty work uh, for, for extensive parts. Obviously, he had also a couple of good outlet passes, but I think more importantly, he, he kept Dortmund's structure alive for very large parts of the game and uh, to me um, that is very important. It's also very good to see that Füllkrug slots in very well while Alea is still trying to recover um, his form. Um, I don't know if he has medical issues but there were reports about Alea that uh, sort of his his values are just uh, basically in the basement and that he is trying and very hard to get back into into top physical shape. Um, but while that is not the case, I think Füllkrug is a more than capable player um, in Dortmund's system. Now, if we compare that with Modest last season, 
it's just such a it's an entirely different continent we're on with Phil Krug and I'm I'm very happy uh for that transfer now because uh in a Champions League game like today it is utterly important to have a striker up front who can hold on to the ball and uh distribute a little bit uh, and and keep you possession just very important and it worked out and I'm 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 happy for it and uh lastly um Matthias Marco Reus, I think, once again needs to be singled out because he's not only a workhorse, but he once again showed his quality uh, today in, in, in various moments. Um, just absolute brilliance. And uh, yeah, I'm still, I'm still happy we get to watch him on, on such a high level. No, I agree completely. It was, um, you know, Marco Reus and Mats Hummels having both of them a great season yet again. And uh, that's that's great to see. And overall, I mean, there's not really much more for me to add to this. Um, in the PSG beat Milan 3-0 at the same time. So Milan are in a deep hole. I don't think they've scored yet. Now, granted, this was also the first time Dortmund scored in three matches. But Milan haven't scored. Um, I still think the nil-nil draw against Milan at home was a wasted opportunity that Dortmund should have won. Definitely, yes. But... Um, Milan fans think Milan should have won that match, which, <laughs> okay, that's fine. I'm an Inter fan, so the Rossonieri fans can say whatever they want. Um, I don't quite agree with them in that regard. But uh, the good thing is now that we're basically in the second half, we're in the Rückrunde of the Champions League group <laughs> stages and don't want to have two home matches. And that is not to be underestimated. I still... I'm frustrated by that PSG match in Paris because I do believe this PSG team can be taken by Dortmund. I absolutely believe it. If you put if enough Newcastle can beat them, we can yeah, beat them. If you put enough pressure on PSG, um I think I think you'll beat them. I, I don't think they are that good. It's almost like the name PSG is what concerns players more than the squad itself. Of course, they still have Kylian Mbappe, you know, and you have to account for that. But they don't have Messi and Neymar as well at the same time. Uh, so I think in that aspect, there's just too much respect given, which is what Tezic said, that there was way too much respect given to PSG in that, that first match. So I, I would say... Dortmund, given the trend that Dortmund are on currently, I'm optimistic for Dortmund uh, to advance out of this group stage as second. I, I, I think first is, won't happen at this stage anymore, um, but I think they can definitely finish second in this group. They're in the driver's seat now. They, they won an away match, which no team has done so far. Um, or did PSG win away from home today? I, I don't know if that was in no, Paris. No, I think they won at home. Okay. Um, so the home teams obviously have the advantage so far, it seems. And so Dortmund playing twice at home and then having to go against Milan. And uh, they just have to carbon copy what Inter did to Milan a few weeks ago. And you're you're good to go. So I'm, I'm optimistic. M not even cautiously. I am optimistic now that Dortmund uh, will come out of this group stage in a top two position. Yeah, I'm I'm not quite there yet because I do have respect for, for this Newcastle team and I don't know them at all, which is why I can't really tell if they were just having a bad night or if that's the level they're at. Because if that's the level they're at, then I think Dortmund have a very decent chance and I would share your optimism. But uh, I have a hunch they can probably raise their game a little bit. Um, but yeah, who knows? Uh, obviously... You're right, Dortmund are in the driver's seat now. Um, Felix Metzger did score his first goal uh, for Dortmund today. And I think overall it was a very nice play for Dortmund to create it. So a very nice team goal. Very happy about that. And uh, yeah, like I said, the Champions League for Dortmund will continue on November the 6th. And with that, we can move over to the Bundesliga where Dortmund also won again. I think it was fourth win in a row, right? Uh, Dortmund are still in fourth place, two points off the lead behind Bayer Leverkusen. And of course, Stuttgart are still in second place and Bayern in third level in points with Dortmund, but of course have scored 10 more goals and Dortmund did not uh, drastically improve their goal difference. Um, but that being said, it was a very beautiful goal in the already mentioned 300th game by Julian Brandt. 
a 1-0 win and uh, I must say, <laughs> I don't know, I didn't know that Emre Can had this kind of pass in him uh, and yeah, Julian Brandt with the dink over the keeper, just a beautiful goal to decide it in the 67th minute. Uh, what I found interesting is that the, uh, I think Bremen's right back, not quite sure who it was, um, but in the replay you can see um, he realizes that he has lost Brandt and he just freezes like he's caught in a nightmare uh, or like a toddler <laughs> pooping his pants in the corner. I don't know how to exactly describe it, but uh, it was just hilarious how wide open Brandt then was uh, after this dagger of a pass. Um, but overall, Matthias, um, very solid performance. I think one of the most complete performances we've seen from Dortmund in a long time because it was from the first minute till the last where they were dominant and Bremen, I don't recall having any sniff at this game at all. Um, so, yeah, talk me through it quickly if you want. If not, we can already move on to the preview. Yeah, I think Kobel really only had to make one major save of note, but at the end of the day, I mean, even peak Bayern, Manuel Noya had to save two, three times, big time in a match. And I think people forget that. You know, it's like, oh my God, there was a chance there. Well, of course there's going to be a chance. You're playing in the Bundesliga. You know, this, this, these aren't crap teams. They're going to get their chances, especially when you are a front foot team like Dortmund. And that's why you have a Gregor Kobel. Or that's why Bayern have a Manuel Neuer type player. That's why teams invest in really good keepers. And really good teams have really good keepers because the few chances that the other team has, you want to make sure they don't score. Uh, Dortmund were dominant. They were calm. They were professional. Again, though, for me, the, the thing that I'm just hoping will finally tick over soon is that kind of this, and, and I'm totally butchering a translation out of Germany, but <laughs> that the, but that the uh, knot will burst, so to speak, <laughs> that Knoten platzen wird, and Dortmund start scoring the goals from the chances that they create, the plethora of chances they create. Yeah, expected goals I mean, two. 0.71 yeah. to yeah. Bremen's 0.44 in this game. Yeah, yeah, and and if you get a 2.71 without um, a few penalties in there, that basically means 22 shots, five yeah, on target. He, yeah, and it yeah, what it basically means you had four, five, six really good opportunities to score a goal, and I mean really good opportunities, and that needs to happen. That. That was the, the, the kind of the secret sauce of the second half of last season was those chances were then scored. Uh, the good thing is if you flip that around, Dortmund defensively way more solid now than they were in the second half of last season. So given the trend there on, I, you know, it's, it's nice. It's good. I think the positive trend we talked about in the last episode will continue. Uh, it did continue now. Of course, there's a, a big match looming just around the corner that will not be easy. Um, even though, uh, for me, Frankfurt's a bit of a Wundertüte. I don't honestly know what to expect from them. If you look at the teams ahead of Dortmund, again, Bayern because of goal difference. Because uh, they just score a boatload of goals. But they don't have more points than Dortmund, which is just an interesting thing to juxtapose i think after uh, after eight match days it's, it's actually saying something yeah i don't oh, know what 100 percent. it's saying something oh i mean dortmund i mean the funny thing is both teams bayern and dortmund are performing better this season in the first half of the season than they did last season so but the difference is of course leverkusen are just on a crazy run as are stuttgart but of course stuttgart now without Girassi. Uh, who was injured and do you know how, how long he'll be out I for? don't I, I all I read was out for a few weeks okay and well. then I didn't didn't look further and that could that could already be it I mean but they do have uh, Silas that being said he he's not exactly a huge goal scorer um so I think Stuttgart will come back down to earth at some point. It's kind of like Freiburg or Union Berlin last season. Uh, Freiburg have definitely caught themselves better, whereas Union Berlin are just in complete free fall. Uh, they lost again in the Champions League and they're doing exactly what I kind of expected them to How do. How many losses season. in a row is that now from, for Union? Seven? Could that be? Yeah, Seven in a maybe. row? 
Definitely think they've lost. Uh, you know, I think they've lost five in a row in the league, and they've lost every single Champions League match. Well, they do play so, Slumbuster Vera Bremen though, who are 14th while they're 15th. That's 15 true. In the league, but it's crazy that they that's now true. hover over relegation spot. Speaking of relegation spot. I only just realized that FC Schalke in the second division are on a relegation spot, Matthias. There's a, hey, there's, a, there's an hey. actual chance they might play against Borussia Dortmund next season, but it's Borussia Hurra Dortmund 2. Hurra Dabi. It's on, no matter which no matter which way it goes, whether they get promoted <laughs> <laughs> uh, or relegated. Um, Hurra Dabi is on. I do find it funny, because I, I follow the Dritte Liga closely because of Preußen Münster, that uh, Rot-Weiss Essen played against Dortmund's second team, and Rot-Weiss Essen was like, Hurra Dabi. It's like, you do realize you're playing against a bunch of like 19 and 20 year old kids, right? Like, this is not actually the Borussia Dortmund, but you know, Essen, you do you. But that could be Schalke next season. Schalke going to the Preußenstadion. That would be an interesting thing to see. Yeah, uh, de definitely. But uh, yeah, back to the Frankfurt game. So obviously there are a few injury concerns. Uh, ben Zabaini on this uh, weird clear where he sliced the ball and Kobel picked it up and it was not a back pass because it was obviously a complete miscontrol. Uh, Might have pulled his hammy there. Uh, Julian Riasson obviously did not travel with the team to Newcastle because he is under the weather and <laughs> going how the weather was, maybe a few more players will be under the weather after that. Uh, game, so um, yeah, the fullback situation is going to be an interesting one. Might have might have to revert to Marius Wolf and Niklas Süle as our fullbacks. I'm not entirely sure um, what Dortmund will do there, but um, yeah, that is certainly a concern. We also don't know what uh, the problem is with Emre Can's knee. Um, so I. You know, the game is on it's Sunday. It's muscular. It's a muscular injury, so oh, it's not it? a ligament injury. Uh, that was what I saw reported well, by I was zone. hoping he just got a knock, you know. Yeah, and that's what it looked like, almost like a dead leg. Yeah. Um, more than anything else. Where you got hit um, right above the knee yeah. somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So but right, they can right still rule there. you out for a week or, or Of course, of two. course. But like you just said, the good thing is it's a Sunday match, so it's an extra day of recovery now after that cold shower. Yeah, and then we play Hoffenheim in the Cup right after, right? On on Wednesday again, if I'm not mistaken. So, in an interesting week, for sure, for Dortmund. Uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure if this Cup match is going to be a, a home game for Dortmund or an away game. No, it is actually a home game. Uh, 7 p.m. kickoff next Wednesday. So, uh, yeah, the English weeks, as we like to call them, are here and coming in thick and fast because I think after the Hoffenheim game, Dortmund already uh, play against... Uh, said Stuttgart, so Grassi being out for that game might actually be a factor also for Dortmund. Uh, we'll see because this guy is on an absolute heater. I think he's already scored like 14, 15 goals or so. Uh, basically equaling uh, Niklas Füllkrug's record, who was of course the uh, league's uh, top goal scorer last season. Um, which is <laughs> funny enough, but uh, yeah, 14 goals usually not the kind of number that would Burn you the kicker Toya Kanone, but uh, yeah, was not the most prolific season uh, last season. Obviously, also because Alea was out for half the season, maybe otherwise it would have gone toward him. Um, but uh, yeah, Matthias, Frankfurt's seventh have won the last two games against Heidenheim and uh, Hoffenheim. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're they're good against the Heim teams out of the Schwarzwald region. So yeah, they they have struggled yeah. though this this season. They I, have they have not been, you know, not really shown a lot of fireworks. So I'm not entirely sure what to make out of them. Yeah, I mean they've lost some key players. Um, I don't really know what to make of uh, Tino Topmela and his style. Admittedly, I haven't watched a ton of Eintracht Frankfurt this season. Just occasionally, they are a team that I kind of keep an eye on just because I lived in Hessen for a while. Um, where didn't you live? <laughs> where didn't I live? Yeah, I, I did not live in Berlin. So there's that. That's why I just don't care. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's going to be a weird one because historically, Frankfurt have always been a problem, a thorn in the side. side. Um for Borussia Dortmund, uh, but this one, I'm not, I, I honestly don't entirely know what to expect out of Frankfurt. Dortmund, if they can recover some of their players, 
Um, I think, um, okay, uh, the trend is good. It's away from home, correct? Yes, I believe it so. Is. Um, so, I mean, Frankfurt's not that far away from Dortmund. I mean, you're going to drive two hours and you're there. Yeah, two and a half. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a huge travel commitment to be there, especially for a Sunday. So, uh, overall, I think, you know, the trend for both teams is up for sure. Uh, it's going to be a difficult match. I, I have no doubt about that because Frankfurt are just a difficult team. Now they beat Heidenheim, which Dortmund could not. <laughs> yeah. But I also watched Heidenheim completely collapse to, against Augsburg, which is ironic. They dropped a two-goal two lead against Augsburg. They lost 5-2. Um, and uh, Frankfurt played well against Hoffenheim. Even though Hoffenheim took the lead, I, I want to say the first two goals in the Hoffenheim-Frankfurt batch, the assists came from the goalkeepers. Both time it was just a long hoof. And then defenders decided to not defend, and a striker shot and scored. So Mamouche did really well. Now here's yes. a question for you. Obviously, uh, watching this through the lens of the Newcastle game, but uh, I really liked this away performance from Dortmund and uh, was actually quite happy with the three midfielder setup um, and and playing more in the counter. Now, granted, we all know Dortmund's countering right now is not the best. But Dortmund's overall road form in general also not the best. Do you think this is something Dortmund should roll out again away to Frankfurt? Or is this not the game when Dortmund should basically stick to the, say, normal Bundesliga plan of having well, just a double pivot instead of three midfields and then three strikers playing on the corner against a team like Frankfurt? I think it depends on who's healthy. Uh, I think that'll dictate a lot. But I think against Frankfurt, you might as well let them come at you a little bit because, you know, counterattacking is still a huge strength for Dortmund. Um, you know, Nemecha is playing much better uh, in transition, especially. And then you factor in that the pressing and counterpressing is getting better week to week. So I think you can, you know, kind of play a little bit more of a midfield press versus a super high press and just kind of let them come a little bit and then go after them because defensively, I just, I personally don't rate Frankfurt that high. They also haven't scored a ton of goals. Now they, they did score a few goals in the last few weeks. Um, but I, I would be not cautious if I was Dortmund, but I would do a bit of a... Newcastle carbon copy, knowing that you're playing against a team that is lower quality than Newcastle. So I believe you'll get more opportunities at goal. You just have to convert them. That's at the end of the day, I think if Dortmund start converting these chances more and more and more, the comfort will be there more and more. So I that that's my big question mark right now. I need to see more Fukuk goals personally. <laughs> Uh, I don't need to see more Mayangos. I mean, those are always great. And, no, and I do need to see more Mayangos. So <laughs> yeah, because they are they tend to be pretty good. He's but, also a secondary um, striker. You shouldn't discount that. Yeah, that's true. But I, I need our, the strikers need to score. The strikers need to score more goals. Um, and even though fulkrug has been very good, I think he's been very, very helpful to Dortmund offensively and defensively. Um, he's very solid also uh, defending set pieces in that regard. So, yeah, don't give up stupid set pieces, and I think Dortmund will be perfectly fine against Frankfurt. <laughs> yeah, there were a couple uh, at the end where, you know, that one Girena foul uh, certainly didn't need to happen. And I think Gordon of Newcastle drew like 15 fouls uh, throughout the entire game. Dortmund just loved kicking the shit out of him for whatever reason. Uh, but yeah, yeah, this happens. Obviously, uh, the game is on Sunday because Frankfurt will have a game tomorrow against. Uh, HJK <laughs> uh, in, from from Helsinki. So I um, obviously we don't know what injuries will come out of that game, and uh, Frankfurt will be exhausted if they will even take the UEFA Conference League seriously. I'm not entirely sure um, what exactly their plan is, but uh, yeah, the Sunday game uh, certainly should be an interesting one, and it will obviously help Dortmund that Frankfurt also have a midweek game. Um, so, yeah, Matthias, uh, this is pretty much it for me. I don't have much more to say. If you have any closing thoughts, be my guest. 
I mean, not really, <laughs> given that yeah, obviously this is midweek. We've got a lot of matches coming on now. I know we had a, technically a lot of matches to talk about, so it's a little bit abridged, but you know, we want to make sure everyone has an episode to listen to. So I hope you will forgive us for our brevity at this point. Yeah, there's also no no uh, reason in dragging this out. But that being said, I have to get going now. I have to uh, get dog food so my <laughs> dog has something to eat tonight, which uh, has a higher priority than this episode going out uh, uh, right away. Otherwise, I would just uh, hit the upload button. But uh, sadly... A few more things are involved than just clicking a button uh, in producing the show. So, Matthias, uh, I'm I'm afraid people will have uh, to wait until tonight, but uh, I'm sure it's still appreciated that we uh, uh, went out rather quickly with it because otherwise we would have recorded uh, tomorrow, which also still would have been fine. But either way, thank you very much for coming on. Everyone out there, uh, thank you very much for listening. And, uh, yeah. Uh, tune in next time uh, obviously subscribe to the show either on YouTube or wherever else you can subscribe to your podcast and we will be back with an episode after the Frankfurt game and uh, for whatever reason if that's tricky then by the latest after the Hoffenheim match anyhow uh, that's it for us from us for now goodbye